tanks are one of the most formidable psychological inventions that war has ever created. Nothing quite freaks out an enemy like watching a fleet of gigantic armored cannons rolling towards them. To think of it, 20 million people succumbed to death during their debut in the First World War. But between unreliable early tanks and practically unstoppable modern tanks, there have been a lot of crazy innovations and mistakes. Others show what happens when a nation becomes so powerful that it allows its best inventors to run away with their imaginations. Welcome to Nutty History, and today we bring you the true but nutty story of how tanks came to be. Imagine telling a medieval knight that one day they would be able to combine the defense of a castle with the mobility of a horse. The closest thing they would ever envision would probably be an ultra-athletic war elephant. Technically, one European general created something that resembled a tank and used it in the battlefield. His name was Jan Zyska Troknova Kalicha. He was Czech, and at the turn of the 15th century, he armored up wagons and placed cannons inside them. But it's a leap to state that this was a tank as we understand it. For one thing, it didn't have anywhere near the mobility of a tank. Instead, it worked by horses pulling the wagon. When the wagon was in its place on the battlefield, the horses would be removed, and the wagon would just stay in the same spot. Technically, these wagons were more like semi-portable defenses. Instead, it would take a genius to imagine something that could be called a tank in the way that we understand it. And that genius was Leonardo da Vinci. In 1487, Leonardo da Vinci took inspiration from the humble turtle, noticing how the animal's shells aided their protection. So he sketched up what is now called Leonardo's fighting vehicle. To modernize, it looks more like a UFO than a tank but it definitely was supposed to function like a tank. The circular vehicle would be operated by four men using two cranks to make the wheels move forward. Along the base of the tank was supposed to be a row of cannons instead of the modern swiveling single cannon along the top of modern day tanks. The frame of the tank was to be made of wood with metal plates reinforcing it. The sloping nature of the walls of the tank aided the ability for it to deflect enemy projectiles. Of course, Leonardo's tank was never made and a number of issues with the design meant that it wouldn't work very well anyway. For instance, its wheels would almost definitely sink into anything but the firmest ground. Instead, it would take hundreds of years for the world to work out how to implement Leonardo da Vinci's idea in a way that would actually be practical, and even then, the first tanks had major flaws. In the early 20th century, the first car started to appear in the wealthiest of nations. In 1903, a French soldier named Leon Levacassure saw cars rushing by and had an idea. What if you could use an engine to propel a heavily armored cannon? Yes, this was basically what Leonardo had envisaged, but with a single cannon instead of many and with an engine instead of a crank. The Levacassure's design even included caterpillar tracks over the wheels, a key feature in early functional tanks. At first, he saw interest from the Technical Artillery Committee of France, but they wouldn't commit to funding a prototype, so he kept on reworking his design over the course of several years. But in 1908, the committee finally said they had no interest in the project because they thought it was too similar to a tractor. Just imagine how different history and the world's perception of the French would be if the Le Cavachure project had actually made it into production by the time World War I broke out. If the French had surprised the Germans and their allies with tanks when they were just starting to dig trenches, then we could speculate the war could have been over in no time. We'd also probably be thinking of the French as being the bravest and most intelligent military power in the world, instead of, as Willie the Janitor once said, Your cheese eating surrender monkeys! Instead, it wasn't until millions of lives had been lost in World War I when the first tanks arrived on the battlefield. Tanks were a strategic stroke of genius by the British Army to turn the tide of the war. For German soldiers, on the other hand, this was like the folk tales of battle mages, orcs, and monsters to combine into one behemoth being and come true to life. Come to think of it, you know what that sounds like? War and Order, the super amazing real-time strategy and tower defense game that is swooping the world right now with its gorgeous 3D medieval world and state-of-the-art multiplayer battle simulations. You may not get to deploy tanks, but you can recruit dragons to fight for your side as you make alliances with friends and feud with other kings to conquer and build your empire. With tons of upgrades and a fast leveling system, War and Order offers you a medieval fantasy battle system like never before in a true free-to-play experience. By using the link in the description to download the game for free, you will get to enjoy $60 worth of in-game gifts. Absolutely free. Now, back to the video. In 
When World War I broke out and all the sides found themselves deadlocked, the rival powers realized that they finally needed a crazy new invention to win. Both France and Britain started developing tank ideas. The British completed a tank prototype in 1915. This prototype was named Little Willy. Strangely enough, this was the nickname that the British press had called the son of the leader of Germany, Prince Wilhelm. So basically, this would have been like the US Army naming the first drone bombers after OBL's son. Little Willy weighed 16.5 tons. For comparison, the main battle tank of the US Army in 2022, the M1 Abrams, weighs between 60 to 73 tons. The British Army tested Little Willy and soon found out they had some major problems on their hands. First of all, the tank could only achieve a maximum speed of 2 miles an hour, making it almost half as slow as a walking human. They also found out that its caterpillar tracks sagged whenever it tried to cross a trench, causing the tracks to dislodge. This was a major problem as the tank was primarily intended to drive over trenches. On top of this, the engine of the tank filled the inside with poisonous carbon monoxide, making the crew slowly suffocate without realizing it. But the crews were aware of the extreme heat, which would eventually reach 122 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius. Luckily, the British did not scrap the idea. Instead, they built a bigger tank weighing 30 tons, which they called Big Willy, which was also a nickname for Kaiser Wilhelm. Soon, the British Army stopped naming tank prototypes after the leaders of the enemy, probably realizing that it made the bad guys sound good. But the name Willie stuck for a while, with the British tank drivers calling their vehicles Willies for a long time. This was also the time when tanks became known as tanks. When the first tanks were built, to keep them a secret, the factory workers were told that they were building water tanks. And it turns out that name was much more appealing than Willie, so the British Army adopted it as the official name. The official batch of British tanks, which were officially called Mark I's, first saw action on September 15, 1916 in the Battle of Flair Cosolette. Only some of the problems with the prototypes had been overcome, and even then the solutions were not great. For instance, to counter the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning, the crews wore gas masks, and to slightly mitigate the risk of the carbon monoxide causing fires to break out, crews were prohibited from smoking inside the tanks. Just remember that battlefields often feature lots of fire and explosions, making the tanks basically moving catastrophes. They were armed with two six-pound naval guns that had originally been intended to destroy torpedoes and three light machine guns. The fumes from these guns only made the carbon monoxide levels within the tanks worse. 49 tanks had been built and shipped to the battlefield, but even before the battle began, the tanks began failing. 17 broke down and were completely unusable before the first charge. The remaining 32 led the assault toward German trenches, but most of these also broke down or got stuck long before reaching the enemy. But amazingly, nine of the tanks made it to the German trenches. And despite the breakdowns, these nine successful tanks both motivated the British soldiers and terrified the German soldiers. After all, nothing like these gigantic blocks of moving metal had ever been seen on a battlefield before. A group of them had appeared to cross no man's land with ease, with no amount of bullets stopping them, smashing through defenses which had withstood years of attacks. The British soldier Sidney Taylor's testimony really sums up the feeling. This is what he said about being in that battle. It was a funny sensation to see a dozen tanks coming over shell holes. No stopping. Didn't matter what they came over, they got over it all right, and it was horrifying. It gave you a funny sensation to think that all these were coming and they were on our side. They weren't against us. It was a wonderful sensation, really, to see them, but it was horrifying, you know. When the tanks reached the German lines, many of the German soldiers fled in terror, thinking that the machines were indestructible. Others hid below ground, praying to be spared. The French army mocked the British for sending what were clearly half-finished inventions into war. The French, who were also working on their own tanks, said if the British had waited a little longer and made their tanks better, then they would have been much more effective. Instead, now the Germans were aware of what tanks were, meaning they could prepare for the next attack. But as it turns out, the German army and people were completely confused by the British tanks. First of all, the fleeing German soldiers told their generals crazy stories, exaggerating just how powerful the tanks were. This was probably partially due to the impression that the machines had given off and also because the soldiers wanted to do anything to avoid being seen as cowards, which could lead to major consequences, including execution. Additionally, the tanks that had made it only added to the confusion, 
One soldier saw a destroyed tank and stated that the vehicle must have moved on on only a single Caterpillar track, not realizing that the other track had been destroyed. So the Germans had no idea just what a working tank was supposed to look like. And then, of course, was British propaganda flooding the airwaves, claiming that the tanks were unstoppable killing machines. And, of course, these confusing accounts meant that the German army had no idea just how prone to breaking down the tanks were or the fact that only several dozen had been produced. Instead, the German army had to accept that Britain had created a vehicle that could cross the trenches and that Britain might have hundreds or even thousands of these in reserve. They also knew that these inventions would only get better. Sure, some had broken down, but next time the British would have improved them to the extent where many more would successfully reach their trenches. So the Battle of Fleurs Corselette proved to the world that tanks could and would become a key part of wartime operations. Even those in the British Army who had been doubtful about the effectiveness of tanks were convinced that they were necessary to win the war. This included the head of the British Army, Field Marshal Douglas Haig, who reluctantly admitted that tanks were better than horses in industrialized war. He also ordered 1,000 more tanks to be made as soon as possible. The French also decided to rush their own tank designs into production. The first French tanks arrived in April 1917. Only this time, there were 128 vehicles ready for action. This French tank, the Schneider CA-1, weighed 13.6 tons. The 75mm cannon on the Schneider CA-1 tank didn't rest at the top but on the right-hand side. This cannon was so small that nowadays it's considered to be an assault gun. Like the British tank, the Schneider CA-1 was also terrible at just about everything. But its biggest problem was that it struggled to move thanks to its weird front design. This front section had a long nose section that was supposed to have been for flattening barbed wire, but which never actually worked. The inside of the tank was incredibly cramped and uncomfortable. Despite these problems, they took part in the Nivelle Offensive. But the French were able to improve their own tank designs. In fact, by the end of the war, they had created arguably the most influential tank design in all of history, the Renault FT. On May 31, 1918, 30 of these lighter tanks rolled onto the battlefield for the first time ever. By now, the Germans had become used to seeing tanks on the battlefield, and they were preparing to defend themselves against this new fleet when something crazy happened. The turrets housing the tank cannons began to move from side to side. The turret could rotate and aim effectively at enemy targets. These tanks were therefore much more precise and deadly. A number of other innovations made the Renault FT much better than any tank that had come before. For example, the tank was much better ventilated with the engine being equipped with a fan that could effectively force fumes from the tank's interior to the outside. Other nations soon realized that the Renault FT was a superior design and began to order them for themselves. The U.S. generals saw the tank in its testing stage and ordered the construction of 4,400 tanks that slightly modified the Renault FT's design. But by June 1918, none of these tanks had been completed. Therefore, France lent 144 of their own Renault FTs to the U.S. Army. The German army also rushed their own tanks into production. In March 1918, the first five of these, called the A-7V, reached the trenches. Three of them broke down before they got close to no man's land. The other two stopped a few British forces. By the end of the war, Germany had managed to create 20 tanks, but only 10 of these could actually attack. The others just transported cargo. The Germans also managed to capture 170 tanks made by the other side. But by the end of the war, Britain and France clearly had many, many more tanks than Germany could hope to build or capture. Of course, the tank wasn't the only thing that ensured that Germany lost World War I. Rapid advancements in aviation and America's decision to join the battlefield were also major contributing factors. But clearly, tanks shifted the balance of power on the battlefield. Of course, in the next World War, Germany had had plenty of time to make tanks, as the Allies soon discovered and as the next video will make clear. Thanks for watching Nutty History. Don't forget to smash that like button and download the fantastic medieval strategy game War and Order to start building your castle for free from the link in the description below and enjoy $60 worth of free in-game gifts on our behalf. Also, let us know if you enjoyed learning about the nutty history of tanks.